28 countries are taking part in the European parliamentary elections, which begin on Thursday this week. Much to the annoyance to many, the UK will be taking part, despite politicians working towards a deal to leave the European Union. There are 72 UK MEPs currently serving, with one seat vacant. Of those, 43 are seeking re-election, and there are 548 other new candidates. In terms of the broader EU, will there be a new era of populism brought in with these elections, or will it be business as usual? Alexandra Keller joins us now from Control Risks. Alexandra, welcome. First of all, why is the UK fighting these elections? Deep down, does Westminster think we will end up staying in the EU? Well, Westminster weren't given a, a choice on this occasion in order to get the extension to October that um, the EU granted. The EU demanded that the UK had to take part in the European elections just in case they end up staying longer beyond June and when the new parliament takes office. So tell us a little bit more about the themes going into this. We know here in the UK we've seen the polls about the Brexit party. We've seen, of course, a new party at a number of levels come in uh, within the UK with Change UK, the independent group. And we've got some of the old guards of Conservatives, the Tories and Greens and so forth. What's your take on how we're approaching these elections? Is it deep down predominantly Brexit driven or is that a headline that will end up evaporating on the day and we'll just go back to parliamentary lines? No, I think this is very much Brexit driven and I think what we're saying is that the Conservative Party virtually wants to ignore the European elections because it doesn't want to take part in them at all anyway. And so Brexit is very much being left to dominate. And so we've really got a split between the Brexit party itself, which is obviously very pro-Brexit, but anti the deal that is currently on the table. And then on the other side, you've got the Remain parties with, you've got in some polls, the Liberal Democrats overtaking Labour as the second party. So very much there, there's a strong Remain message. The landscape, of course, here is very different from the rest of the other EU um, countries, the other 27 that would be taking part in these. What's the message there from Europe? Because we hear this rise in populism, certainly in some countries. We've seen evidence of it, of course, uh, in Austria and, of course, um, with the um, parliamentary elections in Italy with Salvini and so forth. Is there a, a mood across Europe to move towards that sort of populist end of politics within the EU? Or is, again, just that just a headline that we'll see evaporate? There's truth in that headline, which is that, that the polls indicate that we're expecting to see about a third of the 751 seats go to populist and Eurosceptic parties. That's up from, at the moment, they've got about a fifth of the seats. Um, so there is definitely something in that. Whether that will actually change the way in which the European Parliament functions, the way in which policy is made, is a different question. Why? Because of the, the way that the European institutions function, even if you have a third of, of the seats in the European Parliament, you can maybe move to block some policies. But because policy making is essentially, it starts with the European Commission who put forward proposals for laws, and then they are um, reviewed and voted on in the European Parliament. But without a majority, those populist parties will struggle to, to really make a difference there. Of course, we're all talking about here about to not first past the post, are we? It's, it's, it's proportional representation. How different is that? does that make the, um, the end effect rather than what we have here as a first past the post? Well, what we've seen in previous European elections in the UK is that it does give you a very different picture in terms of, of seats to, to Westminster elections. I think in the past five European elections, only once has the party that has won the following Westminster lecture, election won the European election. So it can give some very interesting results. I also think not just because of, of the voting system, voters themselves see the European elections as a chance to maybe vote for something a little bit different, to register some sort of protest vote. So that can throw up some different results as well. Uh um, which parties across Europe are going to lose out here? If we see this swing towards the populist, to some degree, whatever degree that is, which, which of the parties are going to lose out most, do you think? Well, if we look at the groupings, so at the moment the largest party grouping is the European People's Party, which is the centre-right bloc. And they are likely to still just about be the largest bloc, but they are significantly going to lose their number of seats. So that is parties like the centre-right party that was 
a previous governor in France. Um, that's Angela Merkel's party is part of that block as well. So I think we're looking at very much the kind of establishment parties. And suddenly then the second largest block is the Social Democrats. And that's also parties like the British Labour Party, um, the Socialist Party in France. And those are also likely to see a fall in their vote share. Yeah, what's the, um, what's the order of events then? We've got uh, uh, polling starting on Thursday the 23rd. That's right. But it goes on for several days, doesn't it? It does. So it's four days, essentially because different countries traditionally have different days in which they go to the polls. So in the UK, we, t we go on Thursdays. Other countries, many of them are on Sundays. So it's four days. Does that not cause difficulties? Here in the UK, of course, we want, we're not allowed to say anything during the day's polling. We're not allowed to give any interviews and so forth to people that might give a steer to the way people later in the day might vote compared to how perhaps maybe people voted first thing in the morning. Over three or four days, is that not difficult to control that messaging? It can be, although th there's a limit to which kind of messaging is, is pan-European. I think the other thing that controls it is that even though the vote takes place on Thursday in the UK, vote counting can't start until Sunday. So you don't have the results released, so there's no influence in that way. And then, of course, there's a couple of weeks or three or four weeks after that when the new voted members take their seats, isn't there? It's not till the 1st of July. What happens in that interim period? Of course, a Brexit might happen in that period, I guess. Brexit could happen. Um, I think the other thing is that you might see some sort of rejigging of the party groupings within the European Parliament. There are some parties that have not yet firmly said which grouping they will stay in or, or join because they're new parties. So we'll see sort of almost kind of coalition formation in that way. We'll start to see moves towards who's going to take the big EU jobs later in the year because the Parliament gets to vote on that. So, yes, it'll be a sort of a, a manoeuvring period. OK, well, let's, let's just quickly take us down the, the, the siding about Brexit, because in, this, in that period we do have this uh, bold new vote that's been put on the table by Theresa May, whatever it's going to be called or whatever, um, for her last, I believe, her last attempt to trying to get her deal over the line. As I said, if that is successful and we do end up leaving, what then happens to those people that have voted? Are they ever technically on the payroll of the European Union? If so, do they get paid off? What's the, what are the mechanics involved in all this? Well, I think if it happens before they take office on the 1st of July, then they won't be. But any date after that, then they will officially be on the European payroll. That, that, that makes it very different, of course, as to, the, uh, as to the argument, of course, as to why, why we're doing this in the first place, if we are going to go down the Brexit route. Um, one, uh, one final question is about uh, the EU generally. Do you think out of this we will get any change at all? from the direction of the EU. We're hearing from Macron, he wants more integration, more of a federal type um, organisational structure put in place. There are still pockets of um, uh, disagreement with that. Do you think the main message for Europe is going to change? Uh, of course, we also get a new president, don't we, the European That's Union right. come out of this, which is going to be very exciting, especially if it's some of the candidates that were, are, on, are on the potential list. Um, what do you see coming out of this? What's, what's Europe going to look like in four or five months' time? I think four or five months time will look pretty similar. I, even though we will have a new president, they're very likely to come from the kind of centre of European politics. I don't think we're going to see any kind of, of the more radical ends of the spectrum having those, those plum jobs. I think there will still see the old arguments between France and Germany about what sort of direction the EU wants to get to. And essentially that will just slow everything down and, and things will essentially remain the same with never-ending debate about what they want. Yeah, kicking the can down the road, exactly. possibly. OK, look, Alexandra, we'll have to leave it there, but thanks indeed for joining us. Uh, with a snapshot there of what's to come from Thursday the 23rd of May in those European elections, and after the weekend we get uh, full details coming through just how the spread could change. Will it make any difference? Possibly not. That's Alexandra Kellett from Control Risks.